Welcome everyone to this open lecture on uh, 5G. Uh, this lecture is part of a course we are offering at Mitsubishi University on uh, 5G technologies. So if you find the topic interesting, I will be able to provide you with more information at the end of this uh, lecture. Uh, it's possible to submit a uh, question to our guest here today uh, through the website Menti. So if you go to the website www.menti.com and you insert the code that will appear in on the screen throughout the presentation today, you can uh, send your question to our guest. Uh, today we are here very happy to have here with us uh, Dr. Klaas Johnson from Ericsson. Uh, Klaas has been with Ericsson for over, well over a decade and is part of Ericsson Network. Uh, is currently working with uh, uh, Swiss, uh, in a Swisscom Ericsson uh, joint mobility uh, group, uh, joint mo mobile group. So uh, without further ado, I will leave you uh, the stage, uh, Klaas. Thank you, Luca. And uh, first of all, thanks of all for, for inviting me to give this opportunity to give a bit of an introduction and overview to 5G, the new generation of mobile technology that is now uh, taking off globally. So my name is Klaus Johansson. Uh, I have a background in mobile networks since around 20 years back. I have uh, uh, worked with research. I have worked with system management in Ericsson in strategic product management, so closer and closer to the market. And since almost two years back, I am based in Switzerland, which is a bit interesting in this context because Swisscom was the first 5G network in Europe. And Ericsson has since many years back a very close partnership with Swisscom uh, and a very close R&D collaboration. So it's a great way to develop new uh, technologies such as 5G that we will have a look at today. I will talk a bit about what is possible to do with 5G and a bit about the key technology concepts in the radio access network and end-to-end -end, including the core network and the cloud technologies involved. So 5G is a lot about mobile broadband but it's not only about mobile broadband and with mobile broadband I mean the normal smartphone applications and other type of internet services that we are used to in the 3G and 4G networks. But 5G goes beyond that and I will talk about that more today. But first of all, uh, we can note that 5G has already started to be deployed uh, globally. And with globally, I mean basically in every continent. Uh, Ericsson is very much in the forefront. We have almost 80 networks live with 5G today, <clears throat> end of last year 77, but it's increasing every month, almost every week. Those are in, located in, in around 40 countries. And in addition to that, we have more than 100, 122 commercial 5G agreements. So the number of networks will clearly increase. Those were the Ericsson numbers. If we look in total, there are more than 120 5G networks live globally. Uh, what is important is also that the whole ecosystem around 5G is expanding very quickly. There are already 220 uh, different devices, meaning smartphones, meaning fixed wireless access modems, and various kind of IoT devices coming to the market. And that's of course very, very important. And from a deployment point of view, 5G networks have already been deployed with 15% population coverage. Some of these numbers you can find in the Ericsson Mobility Report. I will put the link towards the end, or you can find it on the ericsson.com homepage. So 5G is taking off very quickly and probably quicker than anyone expected. If we take a, a, a step back, I remember that the, the, the initial deadline and let's say target for the initial 5G launch was actually the Tokyo Olympics that was supposed to be held last year in, in August, right? Uh, but the plans were accelerated due to strong push from the American market and from the Asian market in, in Korea, China and so on. Uh, 5G was launched even earlier, so, so around two years ago now. Swisscom launched in, in Europe, the first network that I mentioned in April 2019. 
I would like to share with you a bit of an overview of 5G with a little video before we go into the more details in the presentation. Two G, three G, four G. They've all revolutionized the way we live our lives. And Ericsson has been leading the way. So when it comes to 5G, it's easy to think it's just another G. Well, it's not. With 5G, things will be faster. And we mean a lot faster. With global mobile data traffic doubling every 18 months, the world's demand for high-speed connectivity increases every second. And that's where 5G comes in, by efficiently providing the capacity for massive data growth. So what does this mean for you? It means high-speed connections for everyone always. Fast and uninterrupted sharing, streaming, and browsing so that you'll never have to fight for data, no matter the competition. But it's not only about speed. 5G will reduce latency to a minimum, making delays virtually impossible to proceed. It means elevating reality even further. It means fiber speeds without fiber at home, for everyone everywhere. And with network slicing technology, every connected service can get its own unique part of a 5G network, fully dedicated and guaranteed for each specific purpose. It means the Internet of Things on an industrial scale, making society more sustainable, increasing resource efficiency, connecting vehicles, to get there both faster and safer. It means protecting the most vulnerable road users, detecting accidents before they happen, and helping save lives with dedicated networks for critical services. With Ericsson's leading 5G technology paving the way, the full potential of connectivity is becoming reality. Join us, let's explore 5G. That was a bit of a crash course to 5G. We will expand a little bit on, on those topics now in the coming um, part of the presentation. So when we talk 5G, you might already have heard and noticed that it's not only about smartphones and what we call mobile broadband. But of course, that will be the baseline. There is simply a need for higher capacity in the mobile broadband networks today. And this is usually referred to as the use case of enhanced mobile broadband. That will bring you more capacity, thanks to deploying more bandwidth, higher uh, channel bandwidth. Specifically, in um, we are talking about two frequency bands uh, that are most commonly used. Uh, the primary one is in the 3.5 gigahertz band, which is the main band in many countries globally, and has a bandwidth of in total typically up to 100 megahertz um, per network, which should com be compared to the typical channel bandwidth of 4G, which is 20 megahertz. So five times more channel bandwidth in, in, in the 5G, 3.5 gigahertz band. In addition, in some markets, like in the US, there is millimeter wave spectrum, spectrum that has traditionally been used for satellite systems and microwave links with lots of bandwidth. We are talking up to maybe 800 megahertz channel bandwidth. Uh, and this spectrum is located then in, in a very high frequency range, uh, around uh, 28 gigahertz, meaning that you have this high bandwidth available. But the drawback is, of course, that the propagation losses are higher so that the coverage and range of the base stations will be shorter. Nevertheless, it's deployed already quite extensively then, for example, in, in the US. That's about enhanced mobile broadband. But in addition to that, we have grouped from Ericsson uh, the 5G use cases into three additional areas. One is what we call fixed wireless access. That is basically uh, fixed broadband at home, but using the mobile network instead of fixed line fiber type of connectivity. And of course, with 5G, with a higher bandwidth and capacity available, this becomes, uh, let's say, a more 
interesting, compelling uh, opportunity for, for many networks uh, in the world, especially where fiber is difficult or, or expensive to, to deploy. In terms of machine type communications, there are two areas that are becoming hotter and hotter. One is the massive IoT, which is a lot about sensors and low power devices, basically to be able to connect all kinds of um, uh, devices and, and um, applications. Here is today uh, using in the cellular network uh, 4G-based technologies, narrowband IoT and CATM type of devices that you might have heard of. Uh, and this will also be the baseline going into 5G, but there will be more type of massive IoT uh, functionality coming when the standards uh, going forward as well. But again, the purpose here is really to, to be able to scale to a massive number of devices that are very energy efficient, so they can be turned on for a very, very long time without changing battery. And then we have what we will talk quite a lot about today, critical IoT. That is where you have requirements on a very high reliability of the communications and quite often a low latency and sometimes also combined with a fairly high bandwidth requirement. So this is where it becomes a bit more challenging from a, let's say, network coverage and capacity point of view to be able to, in a reliable way, support these kind of services. It could very well be in the wide area network served by our macro base stations that are typically deployed for nationwide coverage. But a lot of focus is also on, let's say, Industrial applications in local deployments could be in a factory, for example. And this is where the 5G standards will bring new capabilities and new flexibility, thanks to the new architecture. We will talk about the concept uh, about network slicing. That is also a key concept to be able to combine such critical applications with the more, let's say, best effort type of applications uh, used for consumer services, for example, uh, to, to be able to combine and provide that in the same network. So that will be very important. We'll get back to that. From a capability point of view, what 5G is adding, and this was actually a vision that was formed around 10 years ago in the European research project uh, METIS, uh, where Ericsson was actively involved. Uh, and I would say that the main capabilities that were defined uh, were about supporting higher uh, data volumes, because we know that the traffic volumes are all the time increasing in the mobile networks. We see in the, in the um, predictions uh, and forecasts that are published every quarter in the Ericsson Mobility Report, that in many networks, the data volumes are still doubling every year. In more mature markets, it's a bit lower and sometimes it's higher rate, but it's overall still increasing quite a lot. So to support more data volume is one of the key drivers for 5G. Another driver is to provide higher data rates. And with 5G, we can get up to several uh, gigabits per second speed. And uh, one key technology there is what I mentioned about the new spectrum bandwidth. So the 5G st standard, which for the radio part is called new radio, NR, is uh, one of the key uh, benefits of NR compared to the LTE standard we have used in 4G, is that we can have a more flexible bandwidth allocation. It's still the same modulation scheme, OFDM, but we can have a more flexible channel bandwidth, so it's more efficient to use, uh, for example, this 100 megahertz carrier uh, in the 3.5 gigahertz band to enable also high data rates. Then we have latency. That is maybe one of the most prominent improvements with 5G, to be able to provide a very low latency, initially a little bit lower than 10 millisecond and the standards already have specified latency down to one millisecond. 
And this is what we believe can open up for new type of applications and services and, and innovation that actually leverages this low latency. Then in terms of massive IoT, we talked about the capabilities to connect a large number of devices and have a very battery efficient uh, type of low power devices uh, that can be placed in sensors around the network for a very, very long time. So this is from a, let's say, pure technical point of view, what, what the mobile network capabilities will, will bring with, with 5G. Sometimes when we talk about technology like this, it becomes a bit um, generic and you might wonder what is actually a 5G base station? How does it look? Here I have a picture here from, from Switzerland. So it's one of Swisscom's early 5G base stations. And you can see uh, the antennas. Uh, you have the ones that are in the middle. That's uh, that's the uh, 5G antennas bringing in with massive MIMO technology, uh, 5G in the 3.5 gigahertz band. You still have on the same base station, of course, uh, still 2G, 3G, and 4G, uh, and that is then transmitted with the traditional. Uh, frequency bands. So it's really multi-standard equipment we are talking about in everything from the digital signal processing uh, happening in, in the in the baseband processing units and in the radio units and the antennas. Everything is multi-standard. And I think that is key also to be able to deploy 5G in a cost-effective way that you have uh, this kind of network architecture that you in a flexible way can add the new technology. From a radio point of view, perhaps the most distinguishing uh, technology with, with 5G is about so-called massive MIMO. Already possible with 4G, but with 5G, it's becoming even more efficient. And massive MIMO is when you have a large number of antenna elements, both on the transmitter side and on the receiver side. So, multiple input, multiple output systems. Uh, there are basically two benefits of that. One is that you can be very effective in the beam forming and have active beam forming to, to increase the signal to interference ratio for, for a specific user. And the other one is that you can schedule multiple users at the same time in the same cell. That is multi-user MIMO, right? And I have illustrated it here with this picture, where in a traditional implementation, you, uh, you have a, let's say, broader lobe, uh, so that basically all the users uh, get, get interfered or reached by the signal. Whereas if you have beam forming and multi-user MIMO, you can be very surgical and, and direct your, your, um, your beam to the active users. Increasing the signal to interference ratio and data rates for those users, but also decreasing the interference in the system. And you can then multiplex spatially and, and uh, address multiple users at the same time. So that's one of the benefits with the NR air interface coming with 5G. The other one I want to mention is that with 5G, 3GPP has developed a so-called ultra-lean air interface. And in a sense, it's tied to what we just talked about. So instead of having control channels reaching everyone all the time, uh, which is the traditional implementation in the cellular system, uh, lots of the control signaling is and pilot channels that you would, would need are uh, transmitted per user and only then to the active users. And this means that you reduce a lot of overhead, again, reducing interference. But maybe what is more important is that it allows for energy efficiency because you can have a very uh, fast activation of sleep modes in transmitters and receivers. So the user only needs to be active when it needs to receive data and so on. And the same on the base station side. So this allows for more efficient uh, 
sleep modes and potentially increasing the energy efficiency, which is more and more important. So 5G has the potential to be clearly more uh, energy efficient than, than 4G, thanks to this ultra lean air interface. And to conclude on the radio access network part, before we move over more to end-to-end -end aspects of 5G, I want to give an illustration of how a typical operator would deploy 5G nationwide. And we have those different frequency bands. Uh, here I picked a typical European bands. With the, If you start from the bottom, you have the low band, typically 700, 800, 900 megahertz. These are the bands with very go good uh, uh, coverage, uh, but typically a little bit less bandwidth. Um, you have also the traditional 4G bands, 1800, 2100 megahertz, 2600 megahertz, which have a bit more bandwidth, typically 20 megahertz per channel. Uh, and you then add the 3.5 3 gigahertz band, which could be, have up to 100 gigahertz, 100 megahertz typically per channel. But this is a band that has, uh, due to the higher frequency, uh, lower uh, reach due to more propagation losses. So what you typically would do is that you build out the 5G, 3.5 gigahertz, where it's really needed for capacity and where you want to have those very high data rates, typically then in urban areas, maybe suburban areas, and other places, maybe important roads and so on, where you really want to have good performance. That would be a 5G only band. Then you have the other bands where you still have a lot of traffic on 4G. You have a lot of users on 4G that needs to be served for years to come, and you want to have very good coverage. And these bands can then be shared between 4G and 5G. Uh, and here Ericsson was early out, and we developed a concept called Ericsson Spectrum Sharing, uh, which allows the operator to run 4G and 5G simultaneously in the same band. And if you have this, and you also have the multi-standard capable base stations, basically you can activate uh, 5G with a software upgrade, and you can, you can continue to serve the 4G users uh, with this capacity as well. And, and the 4G and 5G cells are, are time multiplexed basically in a, in a very fast way, instantaneous way. And this has already been activated. For example, here in Switzerland, uh, Swisscom was first out to deploy this as a way to get nationwide 5G coverage. And once you have that, you also have prepared the network to have what we call 5G standalone architecture. That's where you have 5G end to end. Because initially, how 5G has been deployed today is that you have 4G as an anchor carrier. So you have all the important signaling on 4G and use of plane data also on 4G. And then you add the 5G on the 3.5 gigahertz as an additional, uh, let's say, data pipe for, for capacity and, and, and the peak data rates. But with 5G standalone, you have also the anchor carrier on, on the 5G MNAR air interface. And that will be the next step. Uh, has started to be deployed in some network. I think T-Mobile US was first out in August uh, 2020, and it will gradually be introduced in, in, in the networks globally. But again, so far, most networks use 5G non-standalone architecture. So this is how it looks uh, typically from a radio access point of view. Now I will move over and talk a bit more about new services that can be enabled with 5G. Um, we talked about critical IoT applications, or in general, time-critical communications. So traditionally, the design objective, I would say, with, with 4G and, and cellular systems have been a lot about maximizing throughput to have a very low uh, uh, let's say, or, or, or a very high spectral efficiency. Transmit as many bits as possible 
with as high data rate as, and throughput as possible. But there are applications that are more delay sensitive. And sometimes it's very critical to have a high reliability as well, that you know that there are no packet losses. If you talk about uh, various kind of automation processes, for example, in an industrial application. So here 5G will bring new, uh, new capabilities to, to deliver such services. Um, and more flexibility in how you design your quality of service uh, architecture in the network. Some examples here, but I mean, this will be an, an area for innovation. I think no one really knows uh, what kind of applications that will take off and will be uh, eventually uh, used in the networks. Here is a broad picture of, of different applications that are possible. Uh, starting from the top, top uh, real-time media. I mean, clearly there is a strong trend with augmented reality, uh, both for you know consumers and for business applications. Uh, gaming applications move more and more into the cloud, uh, and here you can see that even for consumers, 5G with with time critical communication capabilities uh, could become very interesting simply that you can provide a very low um, control latency. If you start to move into more business and enterprise type of applications, uh, remote control is another example. We have seen a number of early 5G use cases with remote control the diggers and remote control of machines in a mine and applications like that. In uh, industrial applications, 5G is seen as a key, let's say, enabler for the whole Industry 4.0 framework, where which is about automating and digitalizing uh, the factories and, and under industrial uh, locations, having you know closed loop control for process, various kind of processes and robotics in the production line and and supply and so on and so forth. Uh, and you can also go to automated control of vehicles and robots, where of course reliability will be very, very important. But you also typically have a bit of bandwidth requirement there. Uh, in some use cases, you, you have uh, the need to have a real-time video camera transmitting on the uplink, which is also putting challenges on the uplink coverage and, and the data rates that, that you need. And of course, this is just a set of examples where in some cases to the left, uh, you, you might need in the order of tens of milliseconds of latency uh, and maybe 99% reliability is sort of good enough. And to the right, we have examples where it reads to be really tight with maybe down to one millisecond latency and, and close to 100% reliability which is, of course, very challenging from a network design point of view to achieve. Concrete example in a factory uh, that you have a mix of services at, at one location. And this, I think, would typically be the case that it's not only about one type of use case in one location, but the actual end user would need various kind of, of services and applications. So if you look in a factory, we have examples of what we have talked about. The blue ones here is more like massive IoT, where it's you will have a lot of devices, so have low cost devices with long battery lifetime is important. For example, to track uh, parcels and so on in and uh, equipment in inventory management and in the tracking and logistics. Uh, also to be able to do positioning of where things are will be quite important here in the factory, but also elsewhere then when, when things are delivered and, and, and so on. You have the green one here, that's what we call broadband IoT. Here a bit more bandwidth is required, for example, uh, because of a video transmission. Uh, this can be used for various kinds of sensors in the factory, uh, monitoring, surveillance, monitoring cameras and so on. 
maybe not as time critical, but a bit more bandwidth, maybe a few megabit or tens of megabits would be needed. When it becomes even more challenging than critical IoT, I would say high reliability is maybe the most important. And then as discussed, combined uh, often with a fairly low latency re requirement. Uh, could be for, for remote control of, or automated control even of, of uh, different machines and vehicles in the factory. And you can also go in the final example here to more advanced use cases in the production assembly line with collaborative robotics using AR, AI and so on to, to control and steer the whole factory. And, and this is of course a huge area for, for innovation and to, be, to become more efficient in the factories going forward. Just one example, we, I think we will see lots of development in industrial IoT using 5G going forward. To enable this, a key concept with 5G is what we call network slicing. So, of course, uh, you need to dimension the network properly to be able to support the, the services that require a lot of bandwidth or low latency or both. But you also need to ensure that the quality of service targeted is delivered uh, and you want to monitor what you get. And I think one of the key concepts then is what we call network slicing. So in a sense, this you can say you set up uh, virtual private networks, but it's more than the traditional VPNs that we are used to in, in the sort of IP layer. This goes really across the network infrastructure uh, end to end. It means that you can dedicate resources for a certain network slice. It means that you can uh, monitor what you get on that slice. And examples of slices that I think we will see in the mobile networks, uh, of course you will have, if you start from the top of the illustration, you will have the normal enhanced mobile broadband slice, the EMBB slice for the smartphones and so on, the normal traffic that we are used to, more best effort. You could have for, uh, for example, for um, remote surgery or ambulances and so on, critical type of communications. You can imagine that you have slices for massive IoT. You can imagine that you have slices for those kind of industrial applications we talked about. And I think you can set up for, for example, uh, mission critical communications for the police, for the army. Uh, you can think about basically a, a large number of slices being set up and even for specific uh, enterprises to be able to have, for example, if you have um, uh, a bank uh, with a, a, a large number of employees and a number of systems deployed, maybe they want to have a sort of their own virtual network in the, in the mobile network. So they have a control of their devices and so on and so forth. And then the operator could set up a network slice for them. And the key point there to have this economically efficient is really that you run these kind of logical different networks on the same physical infrastructure. So they will run on the same base stations, in the same cells, using the same <clears throat> backward transport network. You will have this, the, um, the higher levels of the higher layers of the mobile network, the core network running on the same data center environment. Uh, and so on and so forth. And that's really key to be cost efficient, to be able to serve a lot of different use cases compared to the more traditional approach where you would have basically dedicated networks for, for every use case, which will be at the end of the day, of course, more expensive and not as flexible to deploy and, and operate. How this could look in practice then is we have this kind of generic example of three different slices being set up and leveraging equipment on, on different, let's say, 
hierarchy levels in the network. But as I said, it runs on the same um, uh, physical infrastructure. Uh, so if, and, and it's based on cloud technologies. So you would have to the right, uh, the central data center, where you run less time critical uh, network functions, for example, uh, uh, to, uh, to control the slices, uh, to set policies for the different slices for the quality of service. Um, you can also do on a central location for the normal, let's say, mobile broadband slice, uh, control plane and user plane in the 5G core network. But then if you move into more, let's say, time critical services, you could choose to deploy some of those network functions at the edge of the network, regionally, uh, or even on prem, on the premises in the factory or at the office location. Uh, if you do that, you would get lower latency and you would allow for uh, local routing of data, which sometimes is important for also for data integrity reasons. Um, there could be uh, use cases and, and um, enterprises that, that see it as important that their data doesn't leave their, their facilities, basically, for security reasons. For these kind of different slices, then, you have the network functions, let's say, dynamically and automated in an automated way orchestrated. That would be very important and monitored. So you see what you get and you can track uh, your quality of service fulfillment for the different slices. But you can also then allocate resources per slice. In the radio access network, that means that the radio resources can be partitioned for this, these kind of different slices. And you also have the normal quality of service enforcement coming per slice. So why is this important? This means that, for example, you can allocate resources for uh, mission critical communications, like for the police. So they will have a guaranteed bandwidth when they need it. Of course, when this bandwidth is not needed for the police, it can be used for other type of applications. So there's no waste from that point of view. It's an, in a sense, a more strict way to do the quality of service allocation in the network. And on top of that, you, on top of that, you can have the normal, let's say, relative priority type of, of uh, resource allocation that, that we always have in the networks, that you can have high, high priority traffic that is scheduled more often than the low priority traffic, best effort and so on. So this kind of dynamic radio resource partitioning is in a sense a more a stronger way to do the QS allocation. So as you see, this will bring a lot of flexibility in uh, that is coming with the 5G architecture. And I think this is enabled by the standards. So 3GPP has defined uh, the radio access network and primarily the 5G core network functions to be uh, possible to deploy in this, in this kind of flexible ways uh, on the cloud infrastructure. So that is the foundation to this. I think for many mobile operators, it will also be a way to modernize their infrastructure because traditionally they had like um, purpose-built uh, hardware and, and uh, not using cloud-based technologies and uh, for, for the software components. So this will allow, allow them to have a sort of service-based architecture, uh, which is a more modern way to, to then um, deploy and, and, and orchestrate and operate the software infrastructure. That is, in a nutshell, what 5G is about. Then going back to, to sort of close the loop here, uh, how 5G is being deployed and started to be used uh, in different countries. It's based on the 4G network still, leveraging multi-standard capable infrastructure. We can add 5G 
first in the 5G non-standalone mode, you still have 4G as an anchor and you add 5G uh, cells with a high bandwidth to get the high data rates and more capacity where needed. And this is where many of the early 5G networks are, are today. Of course, from a use case point of view, it's initially primarily about getting more capacity and higher speeds for the smartphone and has more of a broadband type of use case. In the coming few years, 5G, non, 5G standalone will be introduced broadly. It has already been launched in, uh, in a few markets, uh, and this will then become available more broadly with software upgrades in the coming few years. 5G standalone will be when you get all those capabilities we talked about with network slicing, and you get the pure 5G system end to end. That also allows for low latency and more controlled uh, time critical communication services. And this is what when we start to talk about evolved use cases, we will see more of industrial IoT applications, we will see innovation and more advanced consumer type of services using augmented reality and so on and so forth. And of course, as demand uh, uh, increases, 5G will be densified so that you get the high data rates uh, more broadly with more coverage. The same way as we have seen the, the 3G and 4G networks have been deployed gradually so that, so that you have a better and better coverage and speed across the, across the networks. But having said that, we need to remember that, that 4G will remain in the network for many years to come. In fact, 2G and 3G is still uh, in operation in, in most countries after 20 to 30 years. So 5G is, is added to complement the 4G network and then gradually taking over and becoming mainstream. But that might very well take in many markets another five to 10 years, just to give, give a bit of perspective here on, on the infrastructure evolution. Before we go into Q&A, I also wanted to share with you a few links that I think is useful uh, on the ericsson.com homepage. There are quite a lot of material around 5G, uh, both from a use case and let's say business application point of view, uh, but also technology-wise on the core network, on the radio access network, a lot of new technologies coming in around, around cloud and slicing and how to support time critical communications and so forth. Massive MIMO, you find a lot of information around that on the ericsson.com. And uh, last but not least, I want to mention again the Ericsson Mobility Report. Uh, that is a quarterly report that that is published and always brings new insights, uh, both in terms of the traffic trends, but also in terms of um, new trends and usage of the of the mobile technologies. Now a lot of focus, of course, of 5G and, and IoT technologies. So with that, Luca, I think we can move over to questions. Yes, uh, thank you, Klaas. Uh, so I will give the audience a few more minutes uh, to submit their question on the website. So uh, just a reminder, you can send your question on uh, Menti, so www.menti.com. Uh, in the meantime, I uh, would like to provide you with some more information if you found the content of this uh, presentation interesting and you find uh, that you may want to know more about 5G. We have a course here at Mid Sweden that uh, uh, started with this lecture is a course uh, called uh, 5G, 5G Technologies. And you should now see the, pr the, the, the more information regarding this course. So it's a uh, advanced level course uh, of uh, uh, three credits. Uh, it should last 10 weeks. Uh, the first, the next lecture will be in two weeks time. Uh, this uh, will should, should give you enough time to register to the course. Uh, the course is open for late registration. Uh, the course is tailored towards uh, a working professional, so it's a slow-paced uh, course, and uh, also at the end of the course there is a project which is uh, should be seen as a win-win project that you can 
uh, formulate your own project idea uh, with uh, based on your interest or your company interest and so we can formulate a project uh, description together um, so what else you can also find the link to register for the course uh, on the slide so the easiest way is to go to the meet with university website so you go to www.meon slash iproof which is the name of the project there you can find the 5g technologies course and you can register in terms of requirements, uh, you need to have a bachelor in computer science or like electronic engineering or similar, and you also have to have passed 15 credits in uh, programming. Uh, that is required because we s in the in the course we have some uh, elaboration that requires you to uh, program. However, I, I don't want to scare you off in the sense that if you have passed these 15 credits, I assure you this should be more than enough to uh, to follow the course. Uh, so having said that, I think uh, I have now, I see now a lot of questions coming, so I think we can now move to the Q&A if you're ready, class. Okay. Okay. Uh, a first question uh, I can start with is that uh, what do you think is a killer application in the industry that can only be served by 5G and no, no other existing technologies so far? So that's, uh, of course, uh, the killer question. Um, I, I don't think I can mention one specific application as such, uh, but the way I look at it is that you can do, uh, if you just look on, you know, certain technical characteristics, like, for example, data rate, you can for sure achieve that with, with existing technologies, um, for example, Wi-Fi or, or even 4G or, or other technologies. But I think what, what 5G will bring is that you get sort of the, the foundation of, of the of the mobile systems, the cellular systems, as specified by 3 dpp in terms of mobility and what spectrum you can use, that you can have dedicated spectrum uh, that you have control of, uh, and, and security aspects uh, that come in. And then in this framework, you can start to you uh, to to connect various kind of applications in the industry. Uh, so, so some of them that we talked about here, I think, could be relevant. Is is remote control? I think is is uh, is some is an area where we see a lot of, of interest to you know remote control, for example, machines and and vehicles in an industrial type of a, uh, environment. So that could be one area which I personally would probably not do on a on a, or let's say using more of a best effort type of technology spectrum. Thank you. Uh, so then I have some more technical uh, kind of questions. Uh, so the first one is, uh, with the help of uh, MIMO beamforming and higher frequency, uh, do you think it should be possible to provide better position accuracy to the user? And uh, that could be compared also to GPS uh, type of localization? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, and I think future will tell exactly how good it it, it can be done in a general, uh, let's say, macrocellular network. Uh, I think that for indoor type of applications, you can you can get fairly good uh, accuracy. Sometimes maybe improved by the beamforming capabilities. Uh, but I think that for outdoor applications, uh, it's it's maybe not beamforming alone that is is uh, essential. I think you need to have good reception of the uplink of the of the signals uh, in the downlink and the uplink. So it's maybe more about how 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 dense the networks are deployed and so on than the beamforming as such. But I'm not an expert in, in positioning algorithms, so so maybe there are uh, opportunities here that that uh, I'm, I'm not really aware of. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, then I think you mentioned uh, in your presentation about the energy consumption and how that is critical in some application. One question relative to that topic is um, uh, ask for the different uh, performance in terms of energy consumption of the new IoT protocol in 5G versus 4G, for example, NB-IoT. So 
is there any changes in terms of handshake how the, how the device do the handshake to save energy in the in these new uh, protocols for 5g no, so, so actually uh, the the first generation so the 5g standard that is 3d pp release 15 and now release 16 is coming into let's say commercial application this year uh, they are still relying on the narrowband iot uh, protocols so no real improvements yet in this area i think that will come in um, uh, release 17 of 3 dpp if i remember correctly okay thank you uh, then uh, one more question uh, is uh, regarding the uh, that's called non-public uh, network in 5G. Uh, do you know uh, how that will look like in the future as we move to standalone 5G deployment and maybe we need to have uh, some new non-private network for specific industry for application, industrial application, for example, in which maybe the, broad, uh, the public network may not have the good coverage necessary? Yes. Yes, so there will be a different let's say models around this that that you can you can of course serve the indoor location with an extension of the of the normal uh, public network uh, with a dedicated indoor deployment uh, of base stations but you still have you know rely on the public network from from an end to end point of view uh, what you can also do is that you deploy what we talked about that you can do, let's say, local deployment of some of the network functions that you would normally have centrally, but then you deploy them locally. So that's sort of a hybrid approach where some functions are centrally deployed and some are locally deployed. And then you can have uh, what is sometimes referred to as a private network, a completely dedicated network uh, on premises. And this can then be operated by the mobile network operator or or another actor. There are some countries with where local licenses of, of 5G spectrum is, is available, for example, in Germany. And then you can even think about having your own network or, or some, let's say, network provider focusing on industrial deployments uh, to provide the connectivity. Uh, and that is also possible. And I think this is also the flexibility of the 5G standard uh, that we talked about, that you can have this kind of different network deployment architecture and models. Thank you. Uh, one further question. Uh, there is a discussion regarding uh, the use of uh, 5G, the, the, the use of by 5G of the non-license uh, spectrum. And mm. so the competing coexistence of uh, Wi-Fi network for uh, commonly find in the 5 gigahertz spectrum and 5G uh, network. Uh, this is also in the perspective of future uh, Wi-Fi 6E and the use of the 6 gigahertz spectrum. W what do you think will be the future in those kind of uh, unlicensed spectrum? Will we see both technology competing? Will we instead be seeing a clear winner between the two? And maybe 5G will substitute and over overtake the place of uh, Wi-Fi? Yeah, it's also a good question, and it's sort of the same question that we've had uh, since many years back in, in the industry. Uh, you know, this kind of technology competition between uh, the 3D people standards and the Wi-Fi standards. And, and, and I can only speculate, right, uh, what, what, what the future will look like. Uh, but I mean, there are clear, you know, use cases for the different uh, types of standards and I, what, what I think is increasingly clear is that what we mentioned that if you really want high reliability and control of the services and coverage and interference then there will be a need for cellular standard uh, and dedicated licensed spectrum. So and then when if the, the, the possibility is to use the NRR interface in an unlicensed spectrum uh, that will maybe primarily, as I look at it personally, uh, be of interest if you have a shortage of spectrum. Uh, we have seen, for example, in 4G with the so-called licensed assisted access, where, where even a mobile operator can add uh, cells in the in the unlicensed band, the Wi-Fi bands, using 4G technolo technology as a sort of secondary cell, a secondary carrier uh, with carrier aggregation. That has not been so 
let's say, relevant for operators that have uh, sufficient spectrum. But maybe in some markets where there's very little cellular spectrum, it can, have, it can be sometimes uh, of interest. Thank so you. I, think, I think it's not difficult. It's not easy to say a, a general answer on that question, right? I think it will depend on the, on the scenarios and the services. Thank you very much. Uh, I think maybe we can move to the last question, and it's more like a, uh, looking into the future. There is already discussion regarding 6G, so I'm, I'm wondering if you could give us some insider perspective of what is being talked nowadays. Uh, where are we heading now that uh, 5G is, uh, is being finalized and we are st start to see the first deployment? When we look at the next 10 years and we look towards 6G, what we should uh, expect from the future? I can only say that 6G is is very much in an early, let's say, research phase. And uh, if we follow the same pattern as previous generations, then we will move into standardization phase in a few years. And then it will take another few years to become reality. So I think in reality, the coming five to 10 years will be uh, a lot about 5G. It's still very early days of 5G. So I think it's from from that point of view, uh, 6G is now uh, entering, let's say, the the research projects. Um, I know in Europe, for example, where Ericsson is, is, is evolved from Ericsson research perspective. But if you're interested, you can have a look. I know that there have been some some uh, uh, white papers and presentations around that. Lately, there was one with you can look for by. Uh, Magnus Frodig, uh, uh, head of the Ericsson Research, that you can look for on, on the internet. So you can have a look into what 6G can be about. Um, okay. So I, I don't have any more details on that uh, to share right now. Thank you very much. So I would like to thank, uh, of course, Klaas for joining us today and uh, sharing his perspective and uh, his knowledge about 5G. I would also like to uh, uh, thank everyone that has joined online and that submit their question to us. I think uh, we have got quite a few, so it was very interesting Q&A. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's all. So if you're interested about the topic, again, I'll invite you to check out the 5G technologies course at uh, Mitsubishi University where you can find more about 5G. Thank you again. Thank you, Lucia, and thank you all for your uh, participation.